Man, it's good to see you guys. Thank you for being here this morning. If you're joining us online, thank you for joining us online. I appreciate you being here as well, but I'm excited. We're gonna talk today about something that's really important, not just for today, but important for us as we turn the corner this fall or this summer and head into fall and um, have a series that's gonna really take us through uh, the rest of the year. I was kind of thinking about this. Um, I know that some of you probably have watched some of the Olympics. I know I have, and, and I'm a particular fan of track and field. And uh, I was watching some track and field and some of those longer events in track and field, they get boring to watch because they're just lap after lap after lap after lap. And you can get up and go make microwave popcorn and you can come back and you know it's still pretty much the same. But the very end of the race is always exciting because there's somebody there that just presses hard, that has that last minute kick, that brings it home and comes home strong. And they're the ones that normally win. What I've been thinking about and praying for is that we as a church, as we round the corner and head into fall at the end of a year where I promised you in January that if you kept on coming, that if you leaned in, that if you applied these things to your life as best you can, that this would be the best year you've ever had spiritually, that you would be a different person this year than you were last year. And it will make you really excited about the year to come. And so we're rounding the corner into that final stretch and we're gonna kick together. We're gonna kick. It's gonna be a race that we're gonna finish well. We're gonna sprint together through the fall to the finish line. And in January, we're gonna celebrate what God's done in your life. So this message today is gonna be important for today, but much, much more important as we uh, sort of uh, interpret and understand the series that you're gonna be hearing more about over the next few weeks that we're going to be starting at the beginning of September. I'm gonna talk to you today about why are there so many rules? Have you ever had anybody ask you that about Christianity? Well, I'd like to be a Christian or I'd like to know more about Christianity or it sounds like it might be something I'm interested in, but there's just too many rules. Maybe that's not something that you've heard, but it's something I hear a lot. It is the mixture of Christianity and religion that has confused people for years and years and years. And there's two types of folks that will benefit from the message today and from this passage of scripture that we're talking about today. One is the person who maybe came up without much of a spiritual tradition, not really raised uh, in church, not really that concerned about um, a relationship with Jesus, maybe unaware that it was even a possibility. And you come to a point in life where you say, this is what I want. Now, what do I have to do? Fair question. I think this is what I want. Now, what do I have to do? or the other end of the spectrum, somebody like myself who grew up in church, who was told about God at a very young age and um, where Christianity and religion were mixed together so effectively that it was very, very difficult to see where one ended and where the other began. And the problem is that religion is man-made and Christianity is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so as we arrive at truth in the middle, maybe you'll find freedom. Maybe it will encourage and inspire you as we answer a simple question. What's harmful? What's traditional? What's essential? In Romans three, the apostle Paul talks about this because the Old Testament was full of laws full of rules, full of regulations, and God gave people a lot of laws and rules and regulations. Let's read that together in Romans chapter three. The apostle Paul writes, therefore nobody's gonna be declared right with God because they follow the rules. Nobody. Now there are a couple reasons for that and I don't wanna give away where I'm heading, but one is that you can't follow the rules, right? That's one reason. And the other reason is, is that even if you followed almost all of them, it still wouldn't impress God. Nobody's gonna be declared right with God by following the rules. Rather through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now apart from the law of righteousness of God, uh, the, the, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between the Jew 
and no difference between the Gentile. Now, I do not know how you grew up and I don't know how your curiosity about faith came about. But many people were told about God in a similar way that they were told about Santa Claus, especially as a child. And as you mature and grow, your theology of Santa Claus develops, matures and grows. But oftentimes, if we're not careful, our true understanding, our theology, our understanding about God never grows. It stays in that infantile stage. And one of the reasons is because we're never challenged with the essentials of Christianity, but oftentimes overwhelmed or inundated with the tradition, the not essentials or the rules. So there are a couple statements that I wanna give you that help us kick this off. And I hope that you'll be interested and lean in and listen carefully whether or not you're brand new to this and trying to ask the honest question, what do I have to do now? Or whether you've been told what to do since you were a child and you're really confused because you know it can't be this complicated. Maybe the tradition or version of God you grew up with doesn't really line up with reality or experience and you're in a place where intuitively you know it, but you're scared to ask the questions because when you ask the questions, ultimately somebody tells you stop asking. A faith that isn't allowed to grow up won't hold up. Do you have a grown up faith? Do you have a faith that's built on a relationship with Jesus Christ or a faith that's built on man made religion? Religion is all about self righteousness and rules, the externals. A relationship with Jesus is all about internal and love. Has your faith ever been tested? Have you allowed your faith to be tested? Because without a tested faith, it can't be a trusted faith because it will never, in fact, hold up. Some people deconstruct, which isn't a terrible thing as long as you deconstruct here in a safe place and allow God to rebuild. But some people, they look at this and say, I have to leave because I know something's wrong and I can't quite figure it out. And they walk away and in some cases never come back. Well, this isn't a new phenomenon. Jesus dealt with this phenomenon. And the problem is that the Old Testament law, that the rules that were given, well, they were given in the first five books of the Old Testament. That's called the Pentateuch. And Moses wrote down some of these laws, you know that. And then there were other laws that were written down. And when the Bible says the law and the prophets, what that means is that the first five books of the Old Testament, which contained all kinds of different laws, you can read them if you want to, there's a lot of stuff in there. And the prophets really were considered everything else in the Old Testament after the first five books. Now, I know that sounds confusing because, you know, you look at some of the people who wrote these or some of the people who were named and they weren't prophets, but the Jews sort of considered them all prophets since they spoke for God as these scriptures were written. So the law and the prophets means the Old Testament as God inspired it and humans wrote it down. The problem is that people didn't leave it with just the Old Testament and God's laws. Now, remember, it's impossible to please God by following the rules. It doesn't impress God. Following the rules doesn't impress God. But people didn't just let the rules stand on their own. The Jewish leaders, the church leaders of the day, they looked at their congregations and they said, you guys probably aren't gonna be able to follow God's law. So we're gonna make up some other rules that'll help you follow God's law. And ultimately we're gonna consider them the same as God's law. And as time goes on, we're gonna write more and more and more and more. And eventually you had over 600 laws that when finally written down hundreds and hundreds of years later covered over 800 pages in something called the Mishnah that was so legalistic and so constricting and so confining that people just threw their hands up and said, no way can we ever live this way? Why so many rules? Well, Jesus never intended all of those rules. Humans did. Now, God's law, of course, was intended. 
and given to us for a purpose that we're going to talk about in a minute. But humans trying to help out along the way. But we think that might be an Old Testament phenomenon. But in fact, it's not. Because you probably know as well as I do that depending on what church you happen to go into, what denomination you happen to be from, what faith tradition you've been around, with every single one comes a whole new set of rules and a subset of sub rules and a culture and expectations where the biblical and the traditional are blended together. And you find if you're not careful that if you ask too many questions, at the end of the day, someone's just gonna tell you to be quiet, to stop asking questions. Because when you really drill it down, a lot of it doesn't come from scripture. It just comes from somebody who decided they wanted to help out, which may have begun innocently, but quickly devolves into control, to manipulation. And that's where the Pharisees were. These religious leaders, when Jesus came on the scene, they had constructed an entire set of rules so they could micromanage your life and make you miserable and judge you based on the things they thought were important. But very, very few of these things were of any concern to Jesus at all. In fact, Jesus said to them in Matthew 23, he said, woe to you, you teachers of religious law. You teachers and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. You know what a hypocrite is? Um, somebody who says one thing and does another. So we had that happen in our, in our home last night. Now my wife, she's not a hypocrite, but last night something happened that made me think she might've been being a little hypocritical. We were getting ready to go to bed. She headed into the bathroom. No sooner had she walked into the bathroom than I got a booty call. You know what those are in my house when you've been married as long as I have. And she yells out, hey, somebody didn't put toilet paper back on the roll. That, that's what that is in my house. And, and I'm like, well, who could that be? There's only two of us who live there in the house. And, and so I, I imagine, you know, Joy had to put the toilet paper back on the roll. Now, do you have somebody in your marriage that's assigned to put toilet paper on the roll? Or do you just do it because you're a good person and when it's gone, you replace the toilet paper? I mean, I don't know. Nobody taught me in pre-marriage counseling or no one told me in any books about who's supposed to do that or who's supposed to do what. Um, but I'm not telling you I've never done it before. And so Joy, she comes out of the bathroom and she's being very sweet, but she's got a point to make. And when she wants to make a point, she makes the point. And she said, I'm upset for two reasons. Now, when a woman has two reasons, you know, she's upset. And I said, explain it to me, sweetheart. So she did. She said, first of all, sometimes you don't put toilet paper rolls back on the toilet paper, whatever, roller. And I said, yeah, guilty. And then she said, secondly, sometimes when you do get toilet paper out, you leave it on the counter where nobody can reach it. And I said, well, sometimes probably guilty. But in my mind, I'm thinking, I know you do the same exact thing, but that wasn't the time for me to say it because that wouldn't have been constructive. But when you know somebody's telling you to do something and they've got two reasons or three reasons and you know that maybe they do the same thing, but you can't really say anything. Well, in some real small way, that's sort of what people intuitively knew about these Pharisees, these teachers of the religious law. They would grab any stump they could and hop up on top of it and tell you how bad you were. But in reality, people knew, yeah, you guys are kind of doing the same thing. And Jesus said, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish. And this was like a platter, like grandma's special serving platter. But inside, the meat's rotten. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside also will be clean. You probably don't know how important that statement is. But I wanna say it again, and I want you to track with me because this is the key to you understanding your freedom in Christ, where you can stand up and say, I don't care what religious people think. 
it's buried right here in the middle of this beautiful, beautiful statement. When you clean the inside of the cup and the dish, then the outside will also be clean. That when we worry about the inside, then the behaviors, the externals, the things people observe and say, oh, you've got to stop doing that. You're having way too much fun. Christians can't possibly do that and try to control and conform. It's not necessary. And not only is it wrong, but it drives people away from the faith. And Jesus says, worry about what's here. And then what comes out, it's going to be clean. But people, we know the gap between a holy God between what being right with God and righteous really is. I know how hard it is to walk with Jesus. And sometimes people, when they see how hard it is to really walk with Jesus, instead of allowing the tension to help drive us to clean the inside so that we live differently on the outside, with no need for a church police or anybody else micromanaging your life or your kids' lives or your behavior or your social media or anything else. Well, life can be different. Jesus knew. Sometimes it takes a while for us to find out. So as we finish our time in just a few minutes, as we come back, I want to talk to you about that freedom that comes from having the inside of the dish clean. What that looks like when the inside of the dish is clean. And then two questions, two principles that will be a gauge of all of your external behaviors that are based on your internal convictions from now through the rest of your life. I uh, just want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. Some people have been introduced to a God that doesn't exist. Many people have been exposed to a certain Christianity that Jesus never intended. I was thinking about it the other day. I was in a room full of, of uh, first responders, uh, police officers, and I was kind of sitting down on a training. And one of them accidentally said a bad word, and um, which, um, you know, who cares, right? But I mean, they immediately looked at me And they were like, oh, you cussed in front of the preacher. And, you know, like they were going to get some kind of a detention in heaven or, you know, and and I get it. I mean, I understand, but I'm like, well, if you don't do that, then what am I going to say the rest of the time I'm I'm here? It's like they they were introduced to a God and a whole thing that's just, I mean, you give me a Bible and tell me your pet peeve and give me time to look up some scripture and I'll come up with a scripture to be able to back up your bias But that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is figure out what Jesus intended in the first place when he called us to a relationship with him. What were the rules for? They were for a reason. The Old Testament law was given by God, God's word, inspired, pinned by a human author. What is it for? What was the purpose of the Pentateuch, the law of the prophets? Well, the Old Testament was good and is good for a number of things. One is it teaches us the nature and character of God. Number two, it teaches us about history and how important it is to know the history of the Jewish people and what's happened to precede the faith that we appreciate and understand today. It teaches us principles from the lives of so many heroes in the Old Testament, like David and Daniel and Joseph and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and Moses. And I mean, you keep going on and on and on. But the law was given for a purpose and it was to show us that we can't meet God's standard. First of all, to tell us that God's holy and he's perfectly holy and it described the holiness of God. And as you'll see, secondly, it was given to us to let us know that we can't measure up, that it takes some pressure off to realize that no matter how much you try, no matter how hard you work, no matter how good you are, you're not gonna be good enough. But that also is a little stressful If you know you're never gonna measure up, you understand that no matter how hard you try, you just can't reach quite high enough. And that's the tension that God intended to leave us with. But again, the problem wasn't, it was just, it just became something other than what God intended to leave us with. 
The problem was that humans got in the way and started trying to get control and adding on to God's law and confusing the issue to where people not only were aware of their inability to please God, but frustrated, hopeless, needing something, someone, a solution. David, even though he lived in Old Testament times, found the solution. In Psalm chapter 16, King David talks about a principle that's beautiful to me. And David is a person who crossed God's boundaries and broke God's laws. I mean, he broke some of the big ones, right? If there are big ones and, and little ones, we talked about that last week. I mean, he had committed some of the sins that, you know, most of us would say put him on the naughty list forever. I mean, he was a murderer. He was an adulterer. I mean, he you know, but he was also a great military leader. He was a poet. He was a servant of the Lord. He was a lot of things. He wasn't defined by his worst mistake. And what he says here in Psalm 16, he says, Lord, you alone are more than enough. You make everything about my life secure. And this verse six right here is what you'll find when you make peace with the law and understand where we're heading with Jesus rules. He said, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Isn't that beautiful? The boundary lines that I can cross and can't cross have fallen for me in pleasant places. I understand it. I get it. I've seen that it is good. And then he goes on to talk about it as David did, this warrior poet. And he said, surely I have a delightful inheritance in heaven. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right side, I will never be shaken. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, not by following the law. So how is a person right with God? By confessing our sin, acknowledging that we can't measure up, that we're not good enough, strong enough, smart enough to make it to God, ask forgiveness for our sin, believe who Jesus is, that he's God's son, that he came to earth 100% man and 100% God, never sinned and never made a mistake, lived a perfect life, died a death he didn't deserve, to take on my sin and yours on the cross, to rise again three days later, defeating sin, Satan and death once and for all, you don't have to say it like I said it, but believe it like I mean it. And you tell him, I wanna follow you. I wanna be your child. I can't follow the law. I don't even know what the rules are. I choose Jesus. And when you choose Jesus, friend, you've chosen freedom because Jesus came to complete the law. Not to contradict or abolish, but to complete and to fulfill the law of the prophets, the Old Testament law of the Pentateuch, not the 611 laws that everybody else wrote and the 65 laws that dealt with what you should and shouldn't do on Sunday. Jesus said, forget about all that. I don't care what you wear. I don't care how you come. I don't care where you come from. If you're a little rough around the edges, I don't care. Come to me. If you're weary, if you're burdened, come to me. I will give you rest. You don't think you're the kind of people who belong in church. You're my kind of people. Come and you'll find a place. So with arms outstretched, Jesus offered the invitation to anyone who would believe. And as Paul tells us in Romans 3, being right with God doesn't come from following the rules. The rules are shown and given to us to show God's holiness and that we can't follow them. But that being right with God comes from a relationship with Jesus. So that leaves me the question that you might ask, whether you're coming from an unchurched background where you've never experienced this before and you want a relationship with Christ and go, okay, what do I have to do now? Or whether like me, you've come from a background where there's so many mixture of tradition and rules that aren't biblical that have muddied the landscape to the point where I just say, look, what do we do now? Jesus was asked that question by a person called a rich young ruler. He was a lawyer. He wanted to know, I like your words, Jesus. I like where you're heading. I'm tracking with you. So why don't you tell me if you can sum up all this confusion that we have with all of these laws and all these rules and all this stuff, just sum it up for me and just tell me. How am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? 
And Jesus, I think, probably said, I'm glad you asked. I'll just read it to you from Scripture, Matthew 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law. And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart, with all your soul. Now, in some, another place in Scripture, this is also repeated. It says with your mind and your strength. But here it says with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. Do you see the simplicity of, in that? Well, where are the 25 different sub laws that tell me how to do that? Well, where are all these people who tell me what that looks like? And Jesus simply said, look, this is what you do. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He said, this is the first and the greatest, the most important commandment. And the second, like this is it, one and two, right? And not 611 plus, you know, I mean, one and two. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets are summed up. Hang on these two commandments. Jesus rules, love God, love your neighbor. So when we study the New Testament, as we study the New Testament, which we do, and the Old Testament, when we try to figure out how it is that we're supposed to live, it all comes back to these two questions. Is this helping me love God? Is this helping me love my neighbor? How is this supposed to help me love God? How is this supposed to help me love my neighbor? Why? And it all comes back to these two things. So we come to some hard stuff. And in the series that I'm going to be taking us through in the fall, we're going to be looking at ways to bulletproof your life. Things that if I were Satan and I'm not, things I would do or have you do to make sure you destroy your life and destroy it forever. I want us to come back every single week to two things. How is me doing this, choosing this, helping me in my love for God and my love for people? I ask you many times, so many times, it frustrates so many of you and I get it. I'm not without compassion. I'm just very resilient and persistent because Jesus was. We talk about forgiveness and people sometimes say, I'm so sick of talking about forgiveness. Would you just stop? And my answer is no. And it's not because there's a rule that says you have to forgive. It's because forgiveness demonstrates a love for God in a way that almost nothing else that you can do demonstrates. And it demonstrates a right view of people and yourself in a way that almost nothing else you can do demonstrates. And so all of the boxes are checked, but it doesn't make it any less difficult. Well, giving, why, why should I give? Because it demonstrates a love for God when God says, look, your treasure and your heart are connected. You wanna show me what you care about, show me what you spend your money on. You care about other people. Well, then give so that they can experience things that maybe you've been blessed and fortunate enough to experience. All the laws about marriage and sex and morality that so many people get so mad about, so upset about, all comes back to these two principles. And it's not because somebody made a rule and told you, you better do it or else. It's because it leads to freedom that comes in a relationship with Jesus as we learn to love him and to love others. So for seven weeks, we're gonna be going through seven different things that all come back to the main thing that will help us round the corner in the final turn of the race that we've had in 2024. And we're gonna pick the pace up and we're gonna finish well. And we're gonna celebrate at the end of December as we look back and we thank God for the specific ways that our lives have changed. And you will be so excited to turn that corner into 2025 that the motivation will take care of itself and we're gonna keep going. And you know what I love? We're doing it together. 
God has a plan for us. And God's plan for us is not for us. It's through us. It's for them who need to see Jesus in the way we live. Father, thank you so much for my friends. And I pray that as we think about these things today, as we maybe are a little confused about some of the, the baggage that we've collected along the way, I pray that we can see with clarity and simplicity this teaching of Jesus. Even the Apostle Paul's writing in Romans 3 reminding us that all of the rules and all of the stuff and all of the baggage that can come when people get their hands in what you have intended to be pure and simple and relational. That not only does it not help us, but it's destructive to us. It sends the wrong message to the world around us. People can't see Jesus through that. And I pray, Father, that we would arrive at this conclusion, that being right with you comes through faith in Christ and Christ alone. That as we learn to love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, we will in fact love our neighbor just like we love ourselves. I pray for my friends who are here, Father, and I'm aware of so many that are struggling right now. Some health concerns, some upcoming surgeries, some concerns and fears of the future, some having financial hardship, some struggling emotionally with anxiety, with depression, with loneliness, some marriages and families falling apart. Some have decisions that they're facing in the future. They're confused, not knowing which way to turn. Some in the middle of great transitions, leaving for college, for med school, for great things, exciting things, but unknown things that can be a little scary at the same time. So I just pray for my friends, Father, and I love them, but you love them far more than I ever could. So I pray you'd let them know that, that you'd protect them, that you'd guide them, you'd bring us back together again next week, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.